A subscription to the China Africa Project's email newsletter is like getting a daily China Africa intelligence briefing delivered straight to your inbox every weekday at 6 a.m. Washington time. You'll get an in-depth review of everything going on in politics, trade, tech, culture, and more. And we don't just focus only on Africa, but also the Middle East and what China's doing throughout the Global South. Try it out free for 30 days. See if you like it. After that, subscriptions are just $7 a month for teachers and students and $15 a month for everyone else. Sign up today at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about that that word you academics really love to talk about, agency. And that's the idea that in the China-Africa relationship that Africans have power and have authority and have standing in this relationship. And it's interesting because the timing right now of this discussion is fascinating as we approach the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. We talk about what's going to be on the agenda, what are African stakeholders negotiating for, but also because of the conversation we've been having over the past one to two months now, but all of these reports that have been coming out about Chinese loans in Africa and other parts of the Global South. We talked to the folks at Aid Data about their big Belt and Road financing report. Then also we talked to the folks at the Johns Hopkins University China Africa Research Initiative about their Zambia research. And it really kind of brings us back to this question about the role of African borrowers in the China-Africa relationship and whether or not they are and they have agency and standing in this relationship. I want to bring you back to a quote, Kobus, from September of this year, where Wu Peng, who is China's top diplomat for sub-Saharan Africa, he was giving a speech at the World Internet Conference that took place uh, back in September in the Zhejiang city of Wuzhen. And here's a quote he said. He said, in Africa, we're not forcing anyone to do anything or holding a gun against someone's head to say that we want you to give us this construction project. And I thought that was so interesting because it's absolutely true. They're not going and putting a gun to anybody's head and saying, you have to take this loan or else, and not imposing themselves on that. And then when we talk about the lack of transparency in the debt, oftentimes it's perceived or framed in the US, Europe, and by many Africans as well, as that this is something done exclusively by the Chinese. But then again, in Kenya right now, the attorney general is fighting civil society organizations to prevent the release of the the standard gauge railway contract. And across the continent, the opacity that is so prevalent is oftentimes imposed by local stakeholders. So, Kobus, you know, that's a part of the discussion that is not focused on really that much. And I think it's worth a lot more exploration. I agree. I think one of the big reasons it's frequently not focused on is because it's not convenient to focus on, you know, because it it, it does take away focus on China and puts focus on the kind of messy and complicated dealings of global South governments. Um, You know, so so it's then, then the agency issue then becomes very much about what kind of institutions are are involved in, in, like what kind of institutional checks and balances are, are involved in a particular African society and how much how much power they have and what are the kind of internal wranglings and, and dynamics going on, you know, which which you know then frequently becomes too complicated too quickly for a lot of a lot of Western commentators. So they kind of like skim over it. Um, you know, but but those are the really the kind of meat of the issue in, in Africa. Um, and, and there's a lot more attention needed to those dynamics. Well there was a fantastic article that ran last week on the Council on Foreign Relations website. China's approach 
to Development in Africa, a case study of Kenya's standard gauge railway. It was written by Oscar Otele, who is a political science lecturer at the University of Nairobi and joins us on the program for the very first time. A very good afternoon to you, Oscar. Uh, good afternoon, Eric and Kobas. How are you? Uh, wonderful. And we are so thrilled that you're able to join us. We really enjoyed your article. Again, the timing was so interesting because of everything that's going on. But the SGR in many ways is an exceptional project in Africa. It's much larger, far more expensive than the vast majority of other Chinese financed infrastructure projects. But with that in mind, tell us about what your research informed you in terms of how this project in particular guides our understanding of China's approach to development in Africa. Oh, well, um, the, the reason for authoring this particular piece of um the article essentially was um, to, to get back into the whole debate about uh, Af China engagement in Africa, sort of uh, to put to the fore some of the facts that uh, have been, uh, you know, sort of uh, misrepresented out there. And um, the reason was uh, to try and expose my analysis along a number of, uh, you know, constructs, particularly one, uh, debt uh, procurement and the whole question about management of debt, uh, national debt. And the que question number two uh, was on the issue uh, regarding environmental safeguard, uh, compulsory acquisition uh, of land and of course uh, land compensation. And finally, uh, if there has been any sort of innovation as far as um, local content uh, is concerned. So um, I have, um, you know, interacted with a number of um, stakeholders, uh, you know, for a period going close now to around eight years, uh, you know, my own experience. And, and so I thought it wise to, you know, share some of the uh, empirical findings uh, regarding a standard gauge railway. And, and what were your key findings? The, the, the interesting um, finding as far as Chinese actors are concerned and the whole question about their ability to adapt to context, you know, context specific, the sensitivity of the local environment based on the local local politics, you know, administrative structures, and therefore, uh, you know, they are they, they are able uh, to sort of not apply a standard uh, template of um, engagement, which is actually misrepresented when you talk about uh, China. China engagement in Africa, because you know these countries uh, do vary. Uh, for example, the situation in Uganda, the situation in Ethiopia is quite different from uh, from um, from Kenya. So, given that uh, China China Road and Bridge Corporation has been around for quite you know for quite some time since 1984, they have they have actually capitalized on their knowledge of local environment, particularly politics in Kenya, and they are able to quietly learn who are the influential actors in the political scene, who are the influential uh, you know, businessmen in the political scene, and use uh, those actors to quietly push for their interests as far as uh, their uh, Chinese engagement infrastructure is concerned. But you're not suggesting there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you would expect that a, an actor like China Road and Bridge Corporation, which is building massive infrastructure projects in Kenya, say the Standard Gauge Railway, the Nairobi Expressway, uh, the Lamu Floating Bridge, they've built a lot of big projects. They're a political actor, just like other foreign companies are political actors in Kenya as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, being political actors and the, 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 que the whole question about, you know, uh, who gets what, how and when actually, uh, you know, does inform the, the engagement of uh, the engagement of these uh, particular actors. And, and if you if you look at going just back at, at the whole inception of the project, there has actually been a debate about how it was started, which interests were behind the conceptualization of the whole project. You, you, you realize that initially the project was actually well intended, uh, you know, uh, speaking to the language of East African master plan and the intention to, you know, to, to link uh, Kenya's uh, coastal, uh, coastal port to landlocked countries uh, in the Great Lake region. And then uh, the businessmen who actually, you know, coined the whole idea about 
SGR and, and package it in a way that now, you know, uh, CRB, CRBC is able to see this as, a, you know, a, indeed a worthy cost to, uh, to pursue. Quietly takes the whole project, repackages it and sells the idea to Kenyan government. And you see now the Kenyan government takes over and, uh, you know, try now to start engaging uh, with the other Chinese actors through the formal, uh, formal, uh, formal structures when indeed there was an already uh, alliance of informal uh, informal actors in the background so this is how the, the engagement initially uh, started and, and now we we we're seeing at the formal level now the realization that there is a lot of information that hasn't been given uh, to the public domain and these are the questions that have actually led to all this uh, mystery about sgr and you know we have been uh, trying to as much as possible try uh, to provide you know uh, necessary information as far as uh, uh, it is engagement, uh, uh, you know, at the start of phase one, phase two, uh, and, and and so forth. So uh, this is how the engagement has has been uh, uh, since 20, 2014. Uh. Just a very basic question, um, you know, fr from the outside of Kenya, um, the the Standard Gauge Railway project is frequently you know, characterized as a major disaster and, you know, as a kind of cautionary tale. But I was wondering how it's actually being seen within Kenya, um, because, you know, one of the data points that I've picked up in reading for this is, is just a coverage by the standard that um, showing that the deputy president, William Ruto, and the ODM, the opposition leader, uh, Raila Odinga, this weekend were, were busy campaigning um, for, for upcoming elections, and they were both kind of fighting to try and take credit for the standard gauge railway so i was wondering how like how popular slash unpopular is the standard gauge rail standard gauge railway within kenya at the moment to the best of my knowledge there is yet to have a, a particular a survey conducted uh, sort of to gather public views uh, towards sgr but if i can contextualize uh, the views about China's engagement in Africa and particularly in Kenya, at least based on Afrobarometer's uh, data, Kenya actually is one of the countries in Africa that uh, has reported positive, at least positive views about about China's engagement in Africa, even though uh, it is varied depending on whether it's businessmen, uh, you know, uh, politician, uh, civil society actors. And, and of course, uh, general citizens. From where I sit, at least based on um, some of the um, you know material benefit, for example, the connectivity uh, between the two major cities, uh, Mombasa and, and Nairobi, there has been um, you know increasingly a popular perception about efficiency that has been brought. Uh, by SGR and and, and 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 that has you know gained momentum over over time, but obviously whenever the question about you know management of public debt and and the whole question you know on sustainability that of course has also tended to sort of erode uh, the positive views about SGR because citizens have always questioned uh, the fact that uh, you know the content of the the content of the agreement have never been put into public into public galleries so we have citizens have always you know, continued to question in terms of uh, whether 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 the facts that are given out about SGR are indeed the actual position. So this gets to the point that you raised in your article that many of the laws governing the the contract, the procurement, the labor management, and the environment, the Kenyan government ignored. So again, a lot of the burden has been put on CRBC and the Chinese side. Now, in many cases, they have, in fact, violated the laws. We have known there's been a number of court cases. There's been some great investigative reporting by Daily Nation that showed management abuse, lots of terrible things being done by CRBC. However, at the end of the day, it's up to the local government, in this case, the Kenyan government, to enforce its own laws. And you said in your report that in the cases of procurement, environment, and labor, they ignored their own laws. Can you walk us through that? Thank you, Eric. That's a very important question from where I sit and actually based on my own reading of China in Africa. 
this problem actually have a central root and i want to believe a uh, cobas eric you are aware where the problem emanate unlike oecd donors china exim bank and other policy bank in china tie procurement requirement to chinese company what does that imply it implies that once the host government accepts to implement a certain infrastructure project which in this case they are aiming to obtain chinese credit it goes without saying that at the end of the day it is actually a chinese company that will be awarded that particular project that is where the problems begin and we cannot hide that fact in this sense when now we juxtapose chinese vis-a-vis african agents already chinese agents is ahead it is now incumbent upon the host government to renegotiate at least to the interest of it is national the whole question of national interest they have to ensure be it procurement be it management of debt be it uh, local content and cases are out there in angola in drc and to some extent uh, ghana and, uh, and nigeria so it's a question of how are we looking at the procurement requirement tied to exim bank vis-a-vis our local uh, local procurement requirement for example kenya's procurement and disposal act has a provision i i i think it's section 6 that uh, exempts government from um, uh, competitive bidding and so they provoke that section 6 to allow for government to government and this particular sec- section of the law has been debated uh, for quite some time by civil society actors this is where the problem is because if there is no competitive bidding it means that for sure we don't know uh, whether government of kenya obtain value for money as far as procurement of sgr is concerned but i i just want to push you a little bit more because i'm not hearing what i thought you were going to say let me bring you back to testimony done by then uh, transport cabinet secretary michael kamau who testified before parliament uh, about the bidding process and he said quote the bidding was opaque The law was stretched and even skewed to allow CRBC to get the tender. The late Professor Ian Taylor in his really fascinating paper on the subject Kenya's Luna, new lunatic express the standard gauge railway, he concluded that corruption also played a very important role. So it's a little bit disingenuous then when the law was ignored when corruption was at stake and, and at play and there's evidence of it it seems to be that then come back later on and say there's not enough local input there's not enough workers when people around Kenyatta got paid and let's be very clear here the the latest evidence is that president Kenyatta has 30 million dollars sitting in offshore accounts somewhere in the new in the rev the latest revelations that we're seeing now we're not suggesting that came from the chinese but we're we're all, we are suggesting that Kenyatta based on what we've seen right now has benefited far more than his salary in the state house would provide so Talk to us a little bit about this idea of the law was ignored and engineered in such a way that CRBC would get this contract and then it was stacked in favor of the the people around Kenyatta to benefit from it. When you cited um, a revelation made by cabinet minister it's true uh, it's true and I agree that actually the revelation and we read it in the newspaper that he made a such particular um, you know confirmation that uh, indeed there was opacity and um, the opacity has to be seen in the context in which government decides to violate its own principles as far as a you know procurement of projects with the huge sums of money is concerned and it's not just it's not just standard gauge railway if i may recall correctly 2013 the sourcing of uh, is it uh, it should be electronic voting kits uh were actually also single sourced and that single sourcing has been uh, seen as promoting this 
uh, opacity as far as um, uh, as far as procurement is concerned. Now, what we are then seeing is that the moment the government decides to invoke Section Six, there is no public participation in the whole exercise. Now, civil society and the public are denied the opportunity to vet the project. When they are denied to vet the project, it also opens the opportunity for now the informal alliance of businessmen who are perceived to be close to the ruling elite. As, as you point out, the you know this has so much to do with Uhuru Kenyatta's own kind of political persona, his own political career. He's, he's so closely kind of tied to the, the Standard Gauge Railway. So I was wondering, to which extent is the Standard Gauge Railway hurting him politically? Um, particularly also now in the context, as, as Eric mentioned, of the, the, the recent, as I think it's called the Pandora Papers revelation, that, yeah, that, that he, you know, apparently has, has uh, you know, kind of like large kind of off, offshore holdings. Um, so to, to which extent is... is the, are the failures of the SGR like directly, to, to which extent is he directly being blamed for it? And do you actually see some kind of political fallout for it? Well, it's a, it's a complicated set of um, interaction and um, it, it's not quite clear or rather easy to link SGR and, of course, the outcome of, uh, you know, uh, President Uhuru's engagement. But for sure, what I can be able to pinpoint at this particular moment is the following. Before President Kenyatta ascended to presidency in 2013, he was one of the deputy prime minister and a minister for finance in the previous government, that is, uh, you know, President um, Mwai Kibaki. And obviously, he knew the interest behind SGR. Because at that particular moment, when he was still the Minister of Finance, memorandum of understanding had already been had already been signed, and he knew the forces behind. To the extent that he ended up personally benefiting is something that, for sure, I cannot say with accuracy that that is the that is the fact. No, there's no there's no direct proof linking his fortune to this project or any specific project for that matter. Yeah, but he knew, he knew the interest behind and, 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 and this speculation and, 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 and based on, um, you know, our reading, you know, hypothesis on how, you know, Chinese actors engage in Africa, you know, the informal alliance uh, between uh, business elite and, and, and political elite, uh, perhaps that, they provide room for speculation. But again, is there any difference between what Chinese companies are doing in terms of forming alliances between political elites and business elites than what Shell is doing in Nigeria or what you know Freeport McMoran is doing in the Congo? I mean, that is the nature of this type of business, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is actually. It's I, mean, I just want to. I just want. I don't think they're that exceptional for doing that. Exactly. In the way they're behaving. They are the same, and and, and you see the whole question about uh, the interest in Chinese is that actually is also is also coming in as a new, uh, you know, as a new actor, and it's posing considerable uh, competition to the existing foreign interest in particular countries, and that's why you know China in Africa has actually become a point of excitement among many observers. So just follow, following up on that, in, in your in your research on the Standard Gauge Railway, did the the conduct of the Chinese of the Chinese contractors, were they to your mind objectively worse than what we've seen from you know kind of from from competitor non-Chinese con- foreign competitors? Uh, maybe not necessarily only in Kenya, but like as, as we've seen in, in, in comparative cases ar- around the continent. You know, are we talking about something unique or uniquely corrupt in, in, in the case in the case of, of of the San Gejova and the Chinese contractors, or is it more a case of a kind of continuation of bad practices that we've seen before? The, the, the case of Chinese actors on SGR in Kenya is not a unique case in my reading of it, and of course based on um, bits of empirical studies that I have found uh, in the field. I mean, to me, it's sort of uh, just a continuation of uh, what's happening, and, and it, in fact, 
it could even be much lesser than other complicated cases in Africa, like what we read in Angola, what we read in uh, Ghana and, 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 and Nigeria around oil interest. You know, just a continuation. When we go back to the origins of the project, a lot of Kenyan MPs are now expressing severe frustration with how it all began. Number one, they were frustrated that the project was not electrified. And they said that electrification would have been a much better way. Rather than introduce a standard gauge, had they just upgraded the meter gauge, it would have been easier to into to cross-link with other East African countries that also had meter gauge. And it would have been about a sixth of the cost, about one to maybe one and a half billion versus the six, six and a half billion that was done for standard gauge. And then this question of the opacity, which was, it seems, imposed on by the Kenyan side as much as by the Chinese side. The Chinese, as we know from the aid data research, include very stringent secrecy clauses, and it looks like the Kenyan side was very eager to to endorse that. But when we go back and look at the origins of this project, it was so different than what it actually turned out to be. And had it been electrified, had it been going up to the Ugandan border, right now it stops in Naivasha because they simply ran out of money. Uh, Do you remember when... Kenyatta, and I think it was Raila Odinga, went to Beijing not once but twice to try to ask for more money to take it beyond from Na- from Naivasha out to the Ugandan border. And the Chinese finally said, you know what, this is a money pit that we're not going to support anymore. And my understanding of it was that Odinga and Kenyatta wanted to have this on concessional terms in terms of the loan. And the Chinese said, nope, we're going to give it to you on market-based rates. And that's what it all broke down over. So, We look at so many of the mistakes that were made in terms of making this an economically viable project or even a more economically viable project. In your research, when you look back at these these missteps that many Kenyan parliamentarians say there were missteps, what do you take away from that? My, my, my takeaway is, is, is the whole question about, uh, you know, poor planning. And it's not just in Africa, in, no, no, sorry, not just in Kenya, but, uh, you know, African, um, African policy planners initially not carefully considering what is needed by the citizen, in, in this case, prioritization and prioritization of um, local needs. And of course, how that is placed within the country's development plans. As I have demonstrated elsewhere, they're actually looking at SGR from the word go. It was an idea started as early as uh, 2003. But given the fact that it had not been given consideration in uh, Kenya's uh, development blueprint, Kenya's Vision 2030, as a main flagship project, Question arose, who was pushing this particular project to the extent that once, you know, President Uhuru came into power in 2013, now the project eventually found it found place in 2013-2017 medium-term plan. So the question about planning vis-a-vis the available resources is something that African government need to think critically as they engage with Chinese counterpart. And that criticality is what we are talking about African agents, the intentionality as far as what is good for local citizen. So looking forward, um, we, we've seen that, like other East African countries, I think including Tanzania and Uganda, talking about their own, like their own independently, possibly non-Chinese funded, um, you know, extensions of this, of the originally planned regional rail network, the cross-border rail network. Um, do you foresee that Kenya will be, that this, the Kenyan Standard Gauge Railway will eventually be integrated into this wider network and that there will be a wider East Africa network? Because I can even, because you know I think I think for the for the development plan of, of the entire region that it really is crucial, particularly you know in, in order to connect all of the different ports that are being built off down the, the, the eastern seaboard of the continent to resource centers like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Do do you foresee that actually getting off the ground at some stage and also that the SGR will actually then be part of it? Yes. Uh, Optimistically, that's something that I foresee uh, happening. 
uh, you know, for the interest of, uh, you know, regional cooperation, uh, I see a point where the, the, these three, three countries, you know, the, the, the ones that have been at the forefront of um, East Africa, a master plan, working hard to bring this railway line connectivity into a seamless network. And for the obvious reason, for Uganda and Kenya, you know, Uganda has, has, has been a, a long-term, you know, leading trading partner of Kenya. So Uganda needs Kenya just the way Kenya needs Uganda. And, 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 and for, for the two to enhance, you know, economic cooperation, the transport linkage is at the core of their cooperation. On the other side, Tanzania is also a good economic partner of Kenya. I love the fact that we're going to end on a positive, optimistic note, Kobus. That's not what I expected for this conversation. The article is China's Approach to Development in Africa, a Case Study of Kenya's Standard Gauge Railway. It was written by Oscar Otele, who is a political science lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Oscar, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. What a fascinating insight onto a much more complex issue than I think most of us are aware of. And we really appreciate your paper, and I recommend everybody to go out and take a look at it. Oscar, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Eric, for having me. Kobas, thank you for you know joining us. And I really appreciate this opportunity once again. Kobas, I am more confused now than when we started the conversation with Oscar. And I say that is, that's a good thing. That's, that's really the best thing possible because the SGR in particular is such a lightning rod. And it's one of these Rorschach tests of China-Africa relations writ large. People can see anything you want into it. If you want to make the case that this was a must-do, most essential development project, you can do it. Because at the end of the day, cabinet secretaries like Macharia will go out there and say, it's not like we had a choice. I always think back to what you say about Huawei. It's not a question between Huawei and Samsung Ericsson or Nokia for 5G. It's Huawei or nothing. And one of the pieces of information that came out in Macharia's testimony a while ago was the fact that there was nobody else willing to finance it and build it. So it was either CRBC or nothing. Okay? So that's interesting. That being said, the, the point that Oscar made, which is that it was the Kenyan side in many ways which was inflating the cost. It was the Kenyan side which was insisting on the opacity. It was the Kenyan side that was circumventing its own laws through Article 6. And it was the Kenyan side in many ways that, that kind of set the terms for Chinese engagement. And as Oscar also said, and as you and I have talked about many times over the years, Chinese stakeholders will adapt to whatever level of governance that they're operating in. So in Sweden and in Singapore, we don't have these problems. But all of a sudden, I think they're reading the room. As Oscar pointed out, CRBC really knows how to play the game in Kenya. They've been there for a very long time, and they just kind of played the cards as they were, as they were told. I'm not making them innocent victims here. They did a lot of bad things. We've actually spoken to several scholars and reporters who've talked about it. The nation has done some fantastic reporting, so I don't want to say anything that lets them off the hook. I'm also not engaging in any kind of whataboutism, but I am saying that there's agency here, and agency kind of swings both ways. And in this case, I think the Kenyan governments have a lot to account for, and it's just despicable in my view that they have not made these contracts available to the Kenyan people who are ultimately going to be picking up the tab on all of this. Yeah, despicable, maybe not surprising. Um, I mean, it, it raises this bigger question, um, which again, you know, at the beginning, which we, we discussed how how it's a lot more convenient, I think, for, for international commentators to blame the Chinese because because in the first place, they have a target on the Chinese anyway. But in the second place... And African commentators, let's be yes. very clear that that trap narrative has a very fertile audience in... In Africa as well. Yes, yes, definitely. You know, kind of, but it becomes it becomes understandable because the other option would be to really dive deep into the weeds of of 
kind of uh, like the the issue which I think is the key one that, that Oscar like laid out very well is this issue of these laws are on the books like a lot of African countries have pretty progressive laws on the books they just happen to not enforce them um, and there that is such a toxic space in African society that idea of like oh these laws are, are you know like the, the, you, you, like if, if you criticize government officials which I remember in, in old days when I was a journalist when you when you point these out they will me they will be the ones leading you to the law book saying like all of these laws are, are you know kind of in uh, on the book very progressive laws and then you know kind of but then it just happens to then fall into this kind of gray zone of the non the non implemented law you know kind of which laws are not implemented in Africa for a variety of different reasons including for example like lack of of uh, of administrative capacity for example but then frequently they're also not implemented because people make money out of them, you know? And that's such a such a difficult space because it's like, what do you do? Like, do you, like does every single, you know, do, do you then kind of try to start to kind of pull together your civil society coalition to try and take the government to court? Like, what is your other options, you know? Um, and particularly also for, for foreign commentators, what are their options? Like, what, like, what, what, what kind of like pressure can they put on these governments that for, for simply not enforcing their own laws? It, it, it creates this kind of like space where they kind of become untouchable, you know? Um, and and it's, it's, it's a very, very kind of big problem in African development. It, and it's endemic across the continent. I mean, and this is, and by the way, this is not uniquely an African issue. It's the same issue here in Southeast Asia as well, where there are countless laws on the books that are summarily ignored. So I don't I don't know if if that's really an issue as well. The other thing that really annoys me about this whole debate, and I just I have no patience for it, is when I hear Germans, French, Americans lecturing Kenyans about not being in debt on railway projects and how that the SGR is is a black hole of money. And you know, you're just like, do you guys not pay attention to the railways in your own countries? I mean, like Amtrak <laughs> has never made a profit. In a hundred years, the German railway network takes tens of billions of of dollars in subsidies. SNCF in France the same way, and I just feel that it's an unreasonable demand that within the first one, two, three years, five years of a big infrastructure project like the Standard Gauge Railway, that somehow miraculously they're supposed to do what Amtrak has never been able to do. I mean, it's just like it's ridiculous. And it's just, I wish these people would just shut up. <laughs> because honestly, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a it's a complete cluster of a project. There's no no two ways about it. The Kenyans overpaid, but I don't know of an infrastructure project in the U.S. that's been done on time and at a reasonable budget. Especially coming from a government with a military where they spend like ten thousand dollars on a wrench. The nature of infrastructure and procurement is inherently corrupt at some level. Because you've got so much money just swirling around. You would need a Singaporean or Swedish or Norwegian or Scandinavian style governance in order to make sure that every penny is accounted for. And that's just not going to happen in these parts of the world. But I don't know. I just don't have patience for the lecturing and the sermonizing and the sanctimonious attitude that comes out of countries where they themselves struggle with the exact same thing, either on subsidies or on corruption. I mean, just talk to anybody who's involved in U.S., Infrastructure, and again, I'm not trying to get into what aboutism here. I'm just trying to say that this is the nature of the game at some level. Yeah, and I mean that that then one, one then wants a kind of a more kind of pragmatic, kind of gimlet-eyed view of, of of these kind of projects, where what you know, kind of what one wants is essentially is the situation that you or one of one of the better outcomes is the situation in in east asia where everyone knows that infrastructure provision in east asia is super corrupt right kind of like everyone knows that like japan korea like there's, there's lots of this through the through the decades there were lots of money changing hands but they changed hands in a way that ended up delivering infrastructure you know that like the whole the whole of east asia is, is covered in rail um and you know and even so, even though those were frequently inflated contracts, they ended up delivering some kind of some kind of infrastructure in, in the end. And you know, and and the the one thing one has to say about the Sand Gauge Railway, and I mean, this is extremely low bar, but like at least there is a railway. You know, whereas in, in some other projects in Africa, there was a project announced, the money vanished, and that project never materialized. In the case of the Sand Gauge Railway, at least there's a train. Then <laughs> the next step would be to try and make that train profitable, which I admit is the hardest step. But maybe the train itself is not going to be profitable, but the economic activity around the railway network ultimately benefits the economy. 
And that's the way I think we need to look at this, and not in a one, five, or 10-year horizon, but these are generational projects. This is not going to be something that we can see a result from next year or the year after. And therefore, one then has to ask the question, like, is the Standard Gas Railway a massive failure because its, because its cargo side isn't at the moment making money, or is it a massive success because it, it manages to, to move people back and forth between these two ma- major economic centers? It's still too Do early. Everyone- yeah. Too early to tell. I mean, it's yeah, too early exactly. to tell. So a big piece of news came out earlier this week that Uganda was able to bring their meter gauge railway. Uganda originally, again, the plan was in the Rift Valley at Naivasha at the, the dry port to connect that to the ports, uh, the border in Uganda. Uh, they weren't able to do that. They didn't get the funding. That was uh, phase three, I think, or 3B of the, of the standard gauge railway. But now what they've done is they brought the meter gauge to uh, Naivasha. So there is actually a way now to bring goods from Uganda through Naivasha. They have to kind of transfer the, the containers over, but it, it can be done. So there is, an, and I think you're going to see a lot of improvisation now in East Africa among the different rail networks that are starting to, to blossom. So Tanzania is building one, Uganda is building theirs to Naivasha, the standard gauge railway is starting to gain some momentum. We're, we're going to see now some harmonization of cross-border trade through the AFCFTA. A lot of things are happening now. And a lot of this would not necessarily have happened without some of the infrastructure that's now in place. So I think we just got to give it time. Um, we don't. I think we still should hold the Chinese accountable for the mismanagement, the misdeeds, the lack of sourcing, all the things that Oscar pointed out in his excellent paper. But at the same time, I think we also have to hold the Kenyans accountable. And that's why this discussion about debt traps and listening to the rhetoric from the, the peanut gallery on predatory lending from the Chinese, I don't think is that constructive because it just simply breaks down. It's too complex. As you pointed out, it, it better serves their interest than it actually reflects the realities on the ground. Last uh, final thoughts to you. Well, the, the big question I think then becomes what holding them accountable means, particularly, you know, kind of like, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to be saying mean things about them on a podcast, you know, it's like it's a different thing to have something, some kind of measure that will actually, they will actually notice, um, you know, and so, so then the question becomes like in, in an African context, particularly like what would that look like? What, what, what kind of mechanisms are we talking about? Are we talking about something on the AU level? Are we talking about something on the, the regional economic community level? Something from so it's at below. the national level. This yeah. has to be at the national level. This has to mean that the Attorney General of Kenya is not blocking the release and fighting civil society to publicize the contracts. At, at, at a minimum, the taxpayers of Kenya have a right to know how much they're going to be paying for and what the terms of that deal is. That's all. I don't think those civil society groups are asking for too much when they're saying, show us the loans. But of course, when you lift up the rock, you see all the bugs, right? And I think that's what the AG and that's what the, the Kenyatta administration, the state house want to prevent. So maybe it's when the president's out of office that we'll see this. I don't know. But that to me is holding them account is at least some transparency on the terms of these loans. Same in Zambia, same elsewhere. Yeah, definitely. I mean, but the, the question then becomes, how do you get that as a taxpayer, you know, in both those countries? Like, big question, like difficult answer. I have no idea. I don't know either. So I don't think we're going to answer that question here. But again, that speaks to the lack of accountability that is so endemic in many African countries and the huge valley that exists between civil society and governing elites, that the governing elites are not responsive to the needs of their people, but they're responsive to the needs of their own crew, clan, tribe, allies, and, and, uh, you know, it's a patronage system. Again, I don't think that's that different from political systems in many parts of the world. Uh, so I don't want to be picking on the, the Kenyans in particular here because actually, I mean, my country is just as dysfunctional in many respects. So, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that what we're doing is anything better. It's just frustrating to watch. And be honest with you, I don't know how much transparency we have in our system. We, we talk about it so much, but I don't know. I mean, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. So somebody will probably educate me on that. Okay, so let's leave it there. Hey, Kobus, we had our first happy hour last week. Actually, it wasn't really a happy hour. I was the only one drinking a beer. <laughs> so you guys were having coffee because it was the middle of the day. I was hoping he was going to bring a Tusker just for the entertainment value of it all. But uh, we had our first happy hour with uh, our, a Patreon member. We're going to be having more this week, and we're going to be doing monthly 
uh, happy hours and get-togethers and Zoom calls with our Patreon members. If you'd like to join this really fun community that we're building over on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. We've got a couple tiers for you to pick from. Uh, we have swag at the highest tier, and you get private briefings with us. But we're also now launching this new uh, weekly digest. And so this is something that's very cool. A lot of people have told us that the daily email is a little too hardcore. It's too much. They're getting too many emails. But if we could package the best of the writing and analysis and tweets and all the things that we're doing into a weekly digest, that would be something they're interested in doing. We're going to launch this first on Patreon. We just finished the template. It looks good. Beautiful. So uh, I'll probably get one out this week, and then from this week forward, we'll do that. And eventually, we're going to be selling it on our website as well. So, but right now, you can only get it on Patreon. Once again, go to Patreon.com/slash China Africa Project. If you have any questions whatsoever about anything that we're doing, about the podcast, about Patreon, about the newsletter, the website, all the cool things that are going on. Feel free anytime to reach out to either Cobus or myself. We love hearing from you. I'm at Eric E R I C at ChinaAfricaProject dot com, and you can reach Cobus C O B U S at ChinaAfricaProject dot com. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another episode for Cobus Van Staden in Johannesburg. I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com/slash/ChinaAfricaProject to share your thoughts on today's show, or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com. <laughs>